The following special episode of Addressing Gettysburg is brought to you without commercial interruption by our Patreon page. Just go to patreon.com slash addressing Gettysburg so you can help support the show and keep it going and growing. Just go to patreon.com slash addressing Gettysburg and help us help you. That's patreon.com slash addressing Gettysburg. And we thank you in advance. Now on with the show. You're listening to Addressing Gettysburg. All right. It is my pleasure to introduce my good friend who's right here, Megan Kate Nelson. Usually they're down below and they make a grand, well, they make a grand entrance coming up the staircase like you are lurking. So one of the things that people have said about this, and I think it is true, that we could be siblings. Yes. And I don't know if it's the scars. scars. We've got the scars and the gray hair. We used to have similar glasses as well. Uh, but uh, yeah, I always we imagined that if we were siblings that I'd have been the one that you would have been begging the parents, like, please let him be in the Christmas photo. I would have been, right, the outlier in the family, I think, as well. Uh, so uh, we've known, I've known Megan for a very long time, and during that time, she has been a very productive scholar. She's done a number of books. Her one, The Three-Cornered War, The Union, The Confederacy, and Native Peoples uh, in the Fight for the West. Uh, that was a finalist in 2021 for the Pulitzer Prize. That's very impressive. Do you get a certificate for that if you're a finalist? No. They just send you an email and say, congrats. No, they, don't they don't even send you an email. Well, nonetheless, <laughs> congratulations. That's, uh, that is huge. Uh, she is also the author of Ruined Nation, Destruction, and the American Civil War. That's the book that we talked about. That is, in fact, one of the first books on environmental history, published by the University of Georgia. And her most recent book, entitled, we have a picture, or we have the book in front of me, and that is called Saving Yellowstone, Exploration and Preservation in Reconstruction America. Today, she is going to talk about the Civil War and Reconstruction in the Far West. Megan Kate Nelson. Thank you so much. That was a very nice introduction after your behavior earlier um, in the panel. And I just want you to know that in addition to not ever forgetting, um, I also believe that revenge is the best revenge. So you'll find out. You'll find out. Um, no, but seriously, thank you to Pete for inviting me uh, to be with you once again at the CWI. I've been here several times talking about a variety of things, and it's always wonderful. Um, and thank you to Ashley and Jill for wrangling me and all of the other historians who are here for you, here with you for this year's institute. I, it is a much harder job uh, than it looks. Um, so thank you all for coming. Um, I, I have to say I prepared this talk thinking I'd be talking to like 10 people over in that other space, given that Lorianne was going to be giving the big lecture. Um, very sad that she is not here. That book is great. You should definitely pick it up, um, take a look at it. Um, but I am happy to be uh, here with you. Um, so thank you for coming. So um, the schedule had originally said that I was going to be talking about my new book, Saving Yellowstone. Um, and I will be talking about Yellowstone. But I figured, given that you are all uh, Civil War history people, you might be thinking, WTH, like what? <laughs> Does Yellowstone have to do with the Civil War? Um, so I'm going to tell you by talking about both the Civil War and Reconstruction in the Far West, um, which, as uh, Pete had uh, already noted, were the, the topics of my previous two books. So what do these two subjects have in common besides just being interest areas of mine that I spent, you know, 12 years uh, researching and writing about. Um, so first, both the Civil War in the Far West and the exploration and preservation of Yellowstone were projects of first the Lincoln administration and then the Grant administration and a Republican party that wanted control over both the South and the West in the 1860s and 1870s. They wanted to keep 40% of the nation's landmass in federal hands. They could not allow it to become either Confederate territory um, or indigenous territory, or remain indigenous territory. Now, here's a guy you might recognize. 
So Abraham, Link Abraham Lincoln, as you well know, was born in Kentucky, grew up in Indiana, then moved to Illinois, lived on and off in DC. Um, but he thought of himself as a Westerner. And when I first read this quote, um, I live in Boston now, but I am originally from Colorado, born and raised. And when I originally saw this quote, I was like, come on, man. Like, this is from 1848, even by that point, Illinois is the Midwest, right? Like, he's not really a Westerner. But uh, in 1848, Lincoln began one of his speeches in the House by stating, I am a Northern man, or rather, a Western free state man, with a constituency I believe to be, with a personal feeling I know to be, against the extension of slavery. So he's thinking of himself not as a Westerner in place, but a Westerner ideologically, that he believes in a West that is free, free from enslavement and free for white settlement. Um, so as a Whig and then a Republican in the 1840s and 50s, Lincoln's Western politics, um, clearly, uh, were anti-slavery. They were also anti-Native. Now, the Republican platform in 1860 did not argue overtly for Indian removal from Western lands, um, but it did argue that, quote, the normal condition of all the territory of the United States is that of freedom. So what does that mean? Um, again, freedom from slavery, of course, but also lands free for the taking. Now, this process, this idea that all lands from coast to coast within the boundaries of the United States are actually public lands that the federal government could then survey and sell to the American people um, and that would necessitate then Indian removal, um, this was a process and an idea that had, had kind of been around for hundreds of years, right? Um, but it was first codified, particularly Indian removal, uh, in 1830 under the Indian Removal Act uh, passed during the Andrew Jackson administration. So by 1860, the Republican platform um, was, it was very comfortable for Republicans to be arguing this. Uh, no one was really arguing against the idea that lands should be free for the taking. Um, the 1860 platform also argued for industrial development, a railroad line from Omaha to San Francisco, and homesteads for white settlers all developments that required federal control of Western lands and Indian removal. So indigenous homelands across the West, the Republicans believed, rightfully belonged to white Americans. And this was the platform that helped elect Abraham Lincoln to the presidency in 1860. Um, and as president, Lincoln continued uh, to support the Republican platform, and its view of a free West. So this is what always interests me about the ways that Civil War history has pretty consistently, in the best case, marginalized, in the worst case, completely ignored or denigrated uh, the campaigns in the far West. Um, and by that, I mean New Mexico and Arizona, parts of Texas and California. What's always been interesting to me is that Whenever we talk about the coming of the Civil War, we're always talking about the Far West, right? I mean, this is the issue that is driving Northerners and Southerners apart, is what to do with 40% of the nation's land mass, most of it west of the Mississippi. Is it going to be a land of slavery? Is it going to be a land of freedom? But then, you know, the cannons fire on Fort Sumter, and poof, it's like Civil War historians are mostly like, oh, <laughs> the West doesn't exist. It doesn't even appear on most maps of the conflict. Just completely cut off, right? Um, so my argument in the Three Cornered War is that, of course, uh, the Republican Party, um, the US government, and most white Northerners were mostly concerned uh, with the battles against the Confederacy, winning that war, um, and then you know, creating the nation's future. Um, but I also argue they located a lot of those dreams of that nation's future in the Far West. And what's interesting about this moment is when the Civil War began, much of the West was really up for grabs. Uh, there were many territories, as you can see from this map, that had been organized um, in the 1850s and then on the eve of the Civil War. 
And again, much of the sectional fight was about the future of these places. Because of the way that migration was working um, from east to west, streams were sort of moving in parallel. And so there were reliable pro-Confederates, pro-secessionists in the southern Sun Belt, what we now know of as the Sun Belt, like extending from Texas all the way to California. You can see from this map, New Mexico territory in this moment encapsulated both New Mexico and Arizona. It was a massive territory. And there were reliable pro-Confederates uh, living in that kind of southern part of it. Mining towns across the west were pretty evenly divided between northern and southern miners. There were actually a lot of fights um, in mining towns about what flag to raise after the war began, including in Taos. Kit Carson was involved uh, in that particular shootout uh, that it turned out to be. Um, and there's this great story, one of the protagonists in the book, um, Alonzo Ickes, who was in Colorado mining gold when the war began. He was in Breckenridge, which is actually a town that was originally named for John Breckenridge. But when he announced for the presidency and you know, on a pro-slavery platform, the northern miners in that town changed the spelling of Breckenridge and added an E instead of an I so that it would no longer be named after that Kentucky politician. So mining towns, kind of up for grabs. The stance of the Mormons in Utah was really unclear. They had just launched their own rebellion against the federal government in the late 1850s uh, and been pretty much tamped down. So it was unclear what they were going to do. And then there are 50,000 Hispano New Mexicans living in New Mexico territory, which is a pretty new territory. They had only been citizens of the United States for 10 years. They had just fought a war uh, with the federal government in recent memory. Were they going to throw in with the US or the Confederacy? They did have a tradition of slaveholding um, of native people in particular, so maybe they'd go either way. And the indigenous peoples living throughout the West were also a wild card. Were they gonna come with the United States? They had been fighting federal armies since the 1840s, since they had gotten there because the federal government had built forts in their territories. You know, would they ally with the Confederates maybe because they saw them as a, as a friend? Um, or would they see the white man's war as just an opportunity, right? To get whatever they wanted uh, out of that conflict. So why did the Union and the Confederacy want the West to begin with? Um, first, gold. It's very expensive to fight wars, as we know. Um, there have been gold strikes, of course, the famous ones in California. There was also gold in New Mexico and in the Rocky Mountains of Colorado. Both the US and the Confederacy thought this would be pretty handy uh, to uh, fund the war effort. So access to and control of gold mines. Second, and almost more important, was access to Pacific ports. Because the blockade, you know, kind of starts rolling pretty early, and Confederates are pretty interested in finding other outlets. Where can they ship their cotton out of? Um, and there are deep water ports in San Diego and Los Angeles. Maybe even they could get their hands on San Francisco. And if they made a deal with the Mexican government, perhaps the Gulf of California would provide a good port for moving goods in and out, right? Of course, the US was very much invested in keeping those ports out of Confederate hands. And then something that we don't talk about um, you know, a lot uh, is that the West was also central to each side's vision of the future. For the Union, again, Lincoln is sort of encapsulating these thoughts in what he is saying, um, and the Republican Party is seeing the West as this great land of freedom, and in the future, uh, it will be an empire of free labor. For the Confederates, the West is a way to expand their empire of slavery. If they can expand from coast to coast, maybe they can get recognition from Mexico, from Europe, um, and then they can also kind of have a point at which they can expand, perhaps even into Mexico, into the Caribbean, um, and, in, and really establish uh, this coast-to-coast -coast empire of slavery. So this is why 
everybody wanted the West. This is why it was in contention. So the United States needed to secure it. How were they going to do it? So the first uh, thing to do was to turn back a Confederate invasion. Now, the Confederacy had made the first move, uh, invading New Mexico territory in two phases, in the summer uh, of 1861 and then the fall and winter um, of 1862. I tell the story of the US Confederate fight for the West in the first two parts of the Three Cornered War. Um, the first move was made by a Texan uh, named John Baylor, who is related uh, to the Baylor family of the university. Um, it was named after his uncle. Um, he was sent to secure the road from San Antonio to El Paso, which he did, uh, and then he got like real bored um, and also really paranoid. And so he decided to just completely act on his own without orders, and he invaded New Mexico territory in July of 1861 um, and uh, managed to force the surrender um, of Fort Fillmore. This is one of the surrenders that David was uh, referring to in our panel. And by August 1st um, of 1861, Baylor had returned to Mesilla, which is a town in, in southern New Mexico territory, and he created the Confederate territory of Arizona. And this territory did not last very long. It was officially admitted to the Confederacy, the only territory um, that had such a distinction. Um, but it didn't, it didn't last so long. So it only ended up really on one map, which you can see here, which is Bacon's map of the war. Um, and you can see now that by August of 1861, super early in the war, the Confederacy extends all the way to the Colorado River. And it was really California that was the goal, and Baylor was imagining that the army that was coming behind him was going to kind of use that territory as a kind of, uh, like, a, just a shuttle. Like, they were just going to move right along that southern um, part of what was New Mexico territory, now Arizona, and use it to launch an invasion of California. So... While this was happening, as I also mentioned in the session, you know, this the U.S. troops in, in the region um, who had been stationed there, were part of the regular army, had already heard uh, that Baylor was doing this. Um, and the Department of New Mexico, after a couple of resignations, um, was under the command of ERS Camby, um, who is pictured here. Um, he comes into the book a fair bit through his wife, Louisa, who is a major protagonist. Um, everyone referred to him as Edward uh, Camby, but she called him Richard. So um, he, I call him Richard throughout the book. <laughs> um, but he signed uh, most of his military co correspondence, ERS Camby. So his job was to defend New Mexico, right? He knew Baylor was in the south. They had suspicions that another army was coming behind. So he started to bring U.S. Army regulars to the Rio Grande from forts across the region. Uh, most of them had been posted in indigenous territories. He recruited Anglo volunteers from New Mexico and Colorado. He recruited Hispano volunteers and militia from New Mexico. And he approved of the hiring of indigenous scouts and spies. In so doing, Canby put together an army that was the most diverse army in any Civil War theater throughout the entirety of the war. So that larger army did, in fact, follow Baylor under Henry Hopkins Sibley. Um, I talked a little bit about this, um, this campaign in the panel before this. Sibley um, was a career military guy. He is, in fact, the inventor of the Sibley tent and the Sibley stove. Um, but he was terrible at paperwork, which is why he never actually uh, trademarked those inventions and never made any money off of them at all. Um, he was also terrible at paperwork and putting an army together. This was just not his skill, right? But he had a big idea, and he sold Jefferson Davis on this idea after he quit his position in Taos, traveled east to Richmond, and he said, look, I can raise a regiment of Texans. They will have their own horses. They will have their own guns. We will march in. We will take all of New Mexico territory by sacking all of the forts that are there, and probably lightly defended because all of the men had moved east. Um, and then we will launch a campaign for California. Jefferson Davis was like, great. 
what's not to like about this plan? He doesn't have to fund anyone. He could just, you know, watch it go. And so he uh, gave Henry Hopkins Sibley his orders um, to put together what became known as the Sibley Brigade. Uh, and they got on the move in the fall of 1861 uh, to march toward Baylor's kind of stronghold uh, in El Paso and Mesilla. Now, I should say, these are small armies compared to the Eastern and Trans-Mississippi theaters. Somewhere between 3,000 3, and 4,500 men on either side. Um, but what I think is interesting about them um, is that they operated over just a huge expanse of territory across the Southwest. And there, if, if we think about one of the aims of warfare, um, you know, one is to win battles, the other is to gain territory, right? Their territorial gains and losses, these two armies, the Sibley Brigade and the Army of New Mexico, were the largest per soldier of any theater of the war, like by a huge stretch, right? So it was significant um, that, that Sibley had developed this plan. You know, he had a relatively small, small army, but moving 3,000 men on a high desert road in winter, where it's still, incidentally, quite cold, you're getting rained on and sleeted on um, in this area of the country in the winter, keeping them fed, keeping uh, all the animals watered, keeping everyone um, you know, hydrated, this was a huge challenge. Um, Sibley didn't really seem aware of all that, and he was also very, very sure that Hispano-New Mexicans and Mormons were gonna come with the Confederates. He was absolutely wrong about that. He also was not able to make any alliances with Mexico or with any indigenous peoples. So he was sort of out there on his own. So you can see his line of battle. I'm not going to go through um, the entire campaign for you here. Um, doubtless some of you have heard of the Battle of Valverde from February of 1862. It was a one-day battle. It was a, a Confederate victory. However, Sibley, what he had wanted to do was to sack Fort Craig, which was about two miles from Valverde. But the minute he marched his men up there, he knew he couldn't do it because Camby had too many men and they had the high ground. And you just can't, like, you just can't charge a fortified position like that. At least he knew that, right? Um, so he moved his men around Fort Craig and they ended up trying to cross at Valverde and so there was a battle. So they won the battle, but they got none of the supplies. And this is one of those campaigns, pre-Sherman, where they're cut off from a supply line. They are living like off the land and their own supplies. And this is also why it's important that he couldn't get Hispano New Mexicans to come with him, right? Because they hid all of their produce from him. So they already had a logistical crisis, even though they were winning battles. They went on to occupy Albuquerque and Santa Fe, but US troops had burned supplies or taken all of them with them um, on their retreat to Fort Union. And so this brought about the march up the Santa Fe Trail. In March of 1862, the Confederates were desperate. They needed to get to Fort Union to get those supplies. They ran in to US troops who had marched on the double quick down from Denver, uh, all gold miners. Uh, they ran into them um, on the Santa Fe Trail in Apache Canyon on March 26. That battle was kind of a draw. Then the US Army defeated the Confederates at the Battle of Glorieta Pass, but not on the battlefield, but because their commander, John Slew, was a lawyer. There may be some lawyers in this crowd. And as you know, lawyers like to read books. So he, in preparation for his command, he had no military experience. He read a book on military tactics, and he really, really became enamored of the flanking maneuver. So he sent one of his majors, John Shivington, along with some um, Hispano scouts that knew the area. He sent a third of his army down to climb Glorieta Mesa and come in the back um, of the Confederate camp. Took them totally by surprise, burned their entire wagon train of 80 wagons. And as I noted earlier, if you get caught out in the high desert with no transportation, they also ran off the vast majority of their horses, you are screwed. 
So in this moment, the Confederate campaign for the West was over because they could not subsist themselves on the road. They immediately retreated to Santa Fe. You can see their line of retreat in blue here. They actually took a huge diversion into even drier country, the northern reaches of the Sonoran Desert, uh, to try and get away from Camby's troops who were just kind of tracking them down on the other side of the Rio Grande. Camby did not want to fight them. Why? Because he didn't want to have to feed them when he defeated them and had them as prisoners, right? Because his supply line was also a little sketchy, right? So he didn't want to have to feed another 3,000 men, so they were just kind of tracking them. Confederates made it back um, to El Paso in May of 1862, and then started this hideous retreat march through West Texas. I know there are some Texans here. You know what that's like. West Texas in June and July walking, because their horses had died, many of them falling by the wayside, um, just passed out from dehydration, many of them died along this retreat. By July of 1862, the survivors staggered into San Antonio. So this campaign really suggests the importance um, of climate and hydrology. They are at high elevation, they don't have much water, they're very reliant on their own supplies, uh, which get destroyed. And also, Logistics, right? We talk a lot about uh, strategy um, and tactics in military history um, in a lot of the other theaters. Um, but as I, I actually felt very justified because I gave uh, this talk uh, to the US Army War College, and, and one of the guys there was like, oh, yeah, amateurs talk about strategy and tactics. The professionals talk about logistics. Yes. <clears throat> so. And I might add that probably, I mean, I think there are a lot of people who are surprised that I started doing military history, but no one more surprised than me, right? And no one more surprised that I was like super into like, what does the wagon look like? How many? How heavy is it? What can they carry in this wagon? Yes. So again, you will read about this in a, in a more kind of narrative style in the Three Cornered War. But the ultimate point here is that by the summer of 1862, the Confederates were out of the West. The U.S. federal government had achieved their first objective, which was keeping the Far West out of Confederate hands. Now, once the Union had pushed the Confederates back across the border, Lincoln and his administration were able to initiate their plan to secure the West in other ways during the Civil War. This was a three-pronged plan. It included political integration, economic legislation, and campaigns against native peoples. So, the Republican-controlled Congress admitted one Western state uh, to the Union during the war, Nevada, in 1864, uh, and they organized five territories, uh, either on the eve of the war or during the war itself. Colorado um, in February of 1861, Dakota in March of 1861, and then Arizona, Idaho, and Montana in 1863 and 1864. So why is this? important. Lincoln sent loyal Republicans um, like John Clark. Hold on. Sorry. I skipped a slide. I don't want to skip John Clark. He's amazing. Lincoln sent loyal Republicans like John Clark, who is pictured here, who um, was a friend of Lincoln's from Illinois, uh, who he sent to New Mexico Territory as a surveyor general, and he is one of the protagonists in the Three Cornered War. So he sent people like Clark to take up civil posts, governors, judges, surveyor generals, um, to kind of secure the political integrity of those territories and their loyalty to the Republican Party and to the United States. And for the most part, this worked. These appointments and territorial organizations also expanded the reach and the power of the Republican Party in the 1860s. Lincoln also kept tabs on Brigham Young and the Mormons in Utah. In October of 1862, he sent California soldiers to establish a camp outside of Salt Lake City. And in 1863, he initiated talks with Brigham Young's emissary, TBH Stenhouse. And I want to just sort of read you what he told Stenhouse when they were kind of negotiating about what Brigham Young was going to do, because this is such a typically amazing Lincoln anecdote. Stenhouse, he said, when I was a boy in Illinois, 
There was a great deal of timber on the farms which we had to clear away. Occasionally, we would come upon a log which had fallen down. It was too hard to split, too wet to burn, and too heavy to move. So we plowed around it. You go back and tell Brigham Young that if he will let me alone, I will let him alone. So the goal here was political stability and federal control of these new territories. That worked, by the way. Brigham Young never gave any aid or comfort to any Confederates. Um, during the course of the war, he let Lincoln alone. Lincoln let him alone, plowed around him. So again, goal here, political stability, federal control, but also white immigration and settlement um, and particularly also the extraction of mineral resources, so still had the eye on the gold prize, right? As Lincoln told Congress in 1861, the abundant natural resources of these Western territories with the security and the protection afforded by organized government will doubtless invite a large immigration when peace shall restore the business of the country to its accustomed channels. But even before the peace, during the Civil War, enabled by victories in the Civil War battles in New Mexico, the Republican Congress was working toward these goals of settlement and development in the West. So here's their second strategy, economic legislation. So after the Lincoln administration and Congress knew for sure that the Confederates had retreated and that the West was firmly, well, sort of firmly, we'll talk about that later, in their hands, they started passing legislation to promote the conquest and settlement of the Far West. Now, these plans, it's important to remember, had been in the works since the 1850s, but Republicans were never able to pass them um, due to Southern resistance. So in May of 1862, just as Sibley was uh, arriving back in El Paso, um, Congress passed the Homestead Act, giving 160 acres of land to American citizens who had never taken up arms against the federal government. So this is explicitly a, a US measure for men and women loyal to the Union. Now, the government did not expect to make a lot of money um, off of this. They were selling the land for like $1.25 an acre, right? So like, they're not going to make a ton of money here. But what was important was the settlement. On July 1st, they passed the first of two Pacific Railway Acts, um, establishing a route from Omaha to Sacramento and then San Francisco. So this was the route advocated by Republicans in the sectional fight over the Transcontinental Railroad uh, in the 1850s. These acts is extinguished, this is the actual legal term, they extinguished native land titles um, wherever there were treaties, right? So took up that land as federal land um, along the route so that Congress could then give those lands to the railroad companies. And then the companies would sell or give away these lands as incentives to settlers and investors and businesses. The transcontinental would provide white settlers with transportation for themselves and their goods. Um, it would connect the mines of the West with the centers of political power in the East. And it would promote manifest destiny, right? That driving idea coined in 1845, the idea uh, that, of course, White settlement was going to happen in the West. It was inevitable, it was providential, it was ordained. Congress also created the Department of Agriculture, and I think this is important like with what Ken was talking about with weather and pointing out that there was a drought happening, right? Um, so in this moment, Congress creates the Department of Agriculture so that agricultural scientists can begin to talk to each other to develop knowledge about improvements in agriculture, to collect data, to publish results. Um, as Lincoln explained, the creation of this department was for the more immediate benefit of a large class of our most valuable citizens. These most valuable citizens were the core of that vision of the empire of free labor that I was talking about earlier, white farmers. They also passed the Morrill Land Grant Act, which had the same goal as the Department of Agriculture nationwide, provided each state with 30,000 acres of public land for each member of their congressional delegation. That land could then be sold, the proceeds used to fund public colleges focused on agriculture and mechanical arts. We have many of these colleges still all over. Penn State is one of them. Uh, they tend to be somewhat significant football powerhouses. <laughs> which is unrelated, maybe. 
They also approved land surveys of the West. Now, most of these in this moment, uh, during the Civil War itself, were local surveys undertaken by Republican appointees like John Clark in New Mexico territory. Uh, Clark had actually gone on an expedition to investigate and survey gold lands in Arizona, wrote a letter informing the Lincoln administration and much of the East Coast that there was, in fact, uh, gold in those hills uh, and prompted a huge uh, gold strike and gold rush in Arizona in 1863. Now, Lincoln believed that the immense mineral resources of some of these territories ought to be developed as rapidly as possible. Every step in that direction would have a tendency to improve the revenues of the government and diminish the burdens of the people, who, of course, uh, had just been informed about an income tax. On the last day of Lincoln's life in April 1865, Schuyler Colfax um, came to see him before he left for a trip to California. Tell the miners, Lincoln said, I will promote their interests to the utmost of my ability because their prosperity is the prosperity of the nation. And we shall prove in a very few years that we are indeed the treasury of the world. All of this political organization and economic encouragement was working. In 1864, Lincoln wrote, it is of noteworthy interest that the steady expansion of the population, improvement, and governmental institutions over the new and unoccupied portions of our country have scarcely been checked, much less impeded or destroyed by our great civil war, which at first glance would seem to absorb almost the entire energies of the nation. So after the war, the Johnson and the Grant administrations continued to work on political integration and economic legislation pertaining to the Far West. So here we come to Yellowstone. During Reconstruction, the US Congress amped up their support for big federal land surveys. Um, the precedent, of course, were federal surveys that Congress had been funding since Lewis and Clark, including the Fre Fremont surveys of the 1840s, the Transcontinental Railroad surveys of the 1850s, and the Mexican Boundary Survey of 57 to 59. Between 1867 and 1871, Congress approved funding for four land surveys across the Far West. The 40th parallel under Clarence King the 100th Meridian Survey under Lieutenant George Wheeler, the Rocky Mountain Survey um, under John Wesley Powell, and then the Nebraska and Wyoming um, Survey under Ferdinand Hayden. Um, this was a time in which Ferdinand Hayden established himself as one of the foremost scientist explorers in America. He is one of the three major protagonists in Saving Yellowstone, which tells the story of his exploration of Yellowstone in 1871, which led directly to the passage of the Yellowstone Act in 1872. Um, and I think about both of these events as reconstruction projects, right? Um, by the way, Hayden hated those other three dudes. Hated them. They were in competition for money. They had to go head to head to ask Congress every single year for funding for their surveys. He especially hated Clarence King, but most people did. So, Hayden, just a little bit about him, he was born into poverty, he was a child of divorce, um, unlike many scientists who were born into elite families. He lit, led a kind of hard scrabble life and it made him super scrappy um, and also a little bit obnoxious. Uh, he was extremely ambitious and competitive. Uh, he ended up uh, training as a geologist at Oberlin College in the 1850s. He had this special talent for collecting and identifying fossils which is not a talent, I think, that most people think about anyone having, but he developed it. He could spot a fossil kind of in the rock, understand why it was important, pick it up, move on. Um, he apparently also was a very fast walker, so he was like the Gary Edelman of, like, <laughs> of this group. Um, he joined several military-led expeditions in the 1850s. He served reluctantly as a physician uh, during the Civil War. At one point he was like, oh, he was living in the Smithsonian. 1862, and he was like, God, everyone's just talking about the war. War, war, war. All I want to do is work, right? But he ended up going because he had training as a surgeon. So he ended up in South Carolina and then as the chief medical officer of the army of the Shenandoah. In 1867, he was finally appointed to lead his own survey for the state of Nebraska. And at this point, and Nebraska was huge, right, at that point. At this point, Yellowstone was one of the few unmapped places in the nation. 
Amateur explorers were getting there in 1869 and 70. He did not want to miss his chance to make his mark and really claim Yellowstone for himself. <laughs> and, remember, ambitious. Uh, and also uh, for professional scientists. Uh, so he lobbied Congress for funding in the spring of 1871. They gave him $40,000, which is a million dollars in today's money. Which is kind of amazing uh, during a time when the, you know, the country is just coming back together, right? Just bringing Confederate states back uh, into the United States. The economy was really still unstable. Um, so the goal for him was to establish his national reputation. Um, and he had help from several federal entities. The Union Pacific Railroad, which had just been completed in 1869. Um, and so we see, I'll connect the dots for you, right? The US Army wins control of the West in 1862. US Congress is able to pass the Pacific Railroad Act. They build the Union Pacific Railroad by 1869 so that Hayden can take it, turn what would have been a two-month journey into a one-week journey. And he's then able to get to Yellowstone in time to do a full survey in the summer of 1871. Because those of you who have been to Yellowstone know, incredibly difficult to get to. And you really can't really be there, except between mid-May and late September. Otherwise, you will get snowed on. And in the 1870s, if you got snowed on and snowed in, you would probably die in Yellowstone, right? So he had a very small window. So the Union Pacific, he also had support from the US military, who sold him all manner of supplies and horses, and also sent a protective detail um, from Fort Ellis in Bozeman. So who did he take with him? He had a rather large group um, at any given time. It was between 35 and 50 people. Um, and several of these survey members were Civil War veterans. As I noted, Hayden was a Civil War veteran. Most of his assistants and some scientists were a little too young to have served in the war. Um, and others who worked as laborers, we don't really know. We can't track their histories as much. Um, but we do know that several of the members, including William Henry Jackson, the photographer, um, were Civil War veterans. And what's interesting about this is they were all US Army veterans. There were no former Confederates on this survey. So even though there was a lot of discussion about Yellowstone being a national space for Northerners and Southerners to come together in the wake of the war and sort of be proud of this unique space uh, in the American landscape, this was a survey consisting entirely of Northerners. So William Henry Jackson was a private in Company K in the 12th Vermont. James Stevenson, who was a manager of the survey, was a private and then a second lieutenant in the 13th New York Volunteers. Anton Schomborn, who was the survey's chief um, topographer, was working for the US Army in the Midwest drawing maps. Charles Turnbull was a US Army surgeon in the Pennsylvania National Guard. And then Gustavus Cheney Dome was you know, a, a kind of the most famous figure here. He was actually famous by the time Hayden got there, and Hayden really wanted to meet him. And so he was really happy when Doan kind of parachuted in, not really, but parachuted in kind of halfway through uh, the survey, because he had been um, in the second mass cavalry from California, so one of the California 100 uh, fought against Mosby, and then, and, or, sorry, Mosby, um, and then transferred um, to Mississippi. Um, and so there were veterans here um, who had uh, wartime experience, most of it um, on the East Coast, right? Um, so um, only Doan really had been um, posted in the West since that time. So the Hayden expedition itself went smoothly. Um, they, were, they arrived in Yellowstone on time in mid-July. They spent two months there. They saw all the major sites that you would see they followed basically where you drive on the two loop roads in Yellowstone. They followed that whole basic map. They sent 45 boxes of specimens back to the Smithsonian Institution. And when Hayden returned to his office in DC in late October, he found a letter waiting for him um, from the PR man of the Northern Pacific Railroad, suggesting that perhaps Hayden should lobby to create Yellowstone National Park. So there are lots of myths around the creation of Yellowstone National Park, right? And uh, one of them is that either Hayden had the idea for it or that earlier explorers had sort of talked about the idea of the goodness of their heart. But it should be remembered, PR man for a railroad company gave Hayden this idea, right? But he did, in fact, 
lobby. Uh, the precedent was the Yosemite Act of 1864, a Civil War action signed by Abraham Lincoln, uh, which had given the lands of Yosemite and Mariposa Grove to the state of California to manage. Now, this was different because the Yellowstone Act was saying, we are going to take land from Wyoming, a little bit of Idaho, a little bit of Montana, and give it to the federal government to manage under the Department of the Interior. So that is why it is unprecedented. That is why we say Yellowstone is our first national park. So Hayden lobbied for it. The bill was introduced in December 1871. Um, the Senate debated in January. There were two major objections to the Yellowstone Act. One, federal overreach. Two, violation of white settler land rights. It's eerie how the past echoes, doesn't it? Um, most of the senators who objected to the Yellowstone Act were from the West. And they were very much steadfast that this would interfere with white settler land rights in particular, and that should not be done. But they were outvoted, and the bill was sent to the House, uh, where similar objections and debates uh, were made. We do have the roll call for the House vote. The passage of the Yellowstone Act was not unanimous. 89% of Republicans voted yes, 70% of Democrats voted no. So it was bipartisan in the end, but it was not unanimous. But the Republicans' strong majority in the House meant that the Yellowstone Act had passed. On March 1st, 1872, the bill landed on Ulysses S. Grant's desk, and he signed it really without any fanfare. No real comment. Now, most Americans approved of the Yellowstone Act. They saw it as something that could only happen in America. It was a moment in which the Republican Party was really reaching for something higher in this moment to achieve the ideals the nation purportedly exemplified, equality and opportunity and access. And they believed that some of this could be achieved in the West. It was also a moment where they thought scientific knowledge is important, right? We are saving the geothermal regions of Yellowstone so that scientists can study them and we can know more about our Earth's geohistory. And they also believe that perhaps Yellowstone was one of these places that really exemplified the exceptional nature of the nation. Um, that this would be a site of unity. Again, a place where Americans could come together, as one uh, kind of critic put it, to recreate themselves, right? With that dual notion of recreation and recreation. It also did not hurt that Republicans had already found the West to be a good place to recruit voters. So it was in their political interest to bring tourists and then settlers to this region. Which brings me to our final strategy for securing the Far West during the Civil War and Reconstruction, and this is Indian campaigns, campaigns against native peoples. To go back to the Civil War just for a moment, Lincoln's War Department had approved campaigns against native peoples across the West. In the Southwest, James Henry Carleton initiated a new policy uh, that would ultimately take hold in the 1870s. No treaties, declare war, go to battle, force surrender, and then remove Native peoples to reservations where they could be converted into farmers and Christians under the control and the surveillance of US Army soldiers. In New Mexico territory, and I talk about this a great deal in the last third of the Three Cornered War, Carleton put his policy into action beginning in the fall of 1862, making war on Navajo peoples and Mescalero Apaches and forcing them onto a reservation 400 miles from their homelands. The Navajo Long Walk, which began in 1864 and lasted until 1866, and then their incarceration um, in what was really a prison camp um, at Bosque Redondo, lasted until 1868, and it resulted in a 25% mortality rate, um, which puts this reservation, I think, on par with Andersonville. I think we can think about it as a prisoner of war camp. And in fact, Carleton called uh, the Navajo and Mescalero Apache people under his care his prisoners. Um, and the reservation was under the control of the Department of War and not the Department of the Interior. Now, reports of conditions at Bosque Redondo sparked multiple congressional investigations. 
And by the time of his death in, in April 1865, Lincoln had actually begun to advocate for new policies that would provide for the welfare of the Indian, as he put it. But his larger goal, as he told Congress in 1864, was always to render the Western territories secure for the advancing settler. Now, Ulysses S. Grant continued these policies. At first, he tried to kind of ride the line of Indian welfare and removal. In 1868, his campaign slogan, let us have peace, was widely understood to refer to both the South and the West. In 1869, he appointed E. Lee Parker, with whom you are quite familiar, uh, to be his commissioner of the Bureau of Indian Affairs, um, the first time any indigenous person had been appointed to such a post, and the last time uh, until quite recently. But then in 1871, Congress passed a rider, actually in the same session that they gave Hayden his $40,000 to investigate Yellowstone. They passed a rider to the Indian Appropriations Bill, which refused to recognize Native nations as sovereign entities. So the government would no longer have to make treaties with them, right? They were not foreign governments. From this point on, and after Ely Parker got kind of shoved out um, by Congress, Grant's stance really changed, and he too began to treat Native peoples as, as an enemy to be subdued and incarcerated. Now, in, in, indigenous resistance had been occurring throughout the West um, in any sort of instance in which white settlers or the U.S. Army engaged with Native peoples or trespassed on their lands. Beginning with the Dakota War of 1862, um, there were also attacks on migrant wagon trains in the wake of the Homestead Act, attacks on miners' outfits after the 1863 Montana Gold Rush, and then in 1866, Red Cloud's War began um, with the Lakota fight to shut down traffic along the Bozeman Trail, which was successful. And in Saving Yellowstone, I tell the story of Sitting Bull and how he really rose to prominence in this period, defending the Yellowstone River Valley and the lands of his people. And I really argue that this is the beginning of the road to Little Bighorn, um, when he starts to actually bring allies together in defense of this region of the country. And this really resulted in the ramping up um, of the federal army warfare against the Lakota peoples, other Plains tribal nations. And this is what we usually talk about, right, as the Indian Wars. And it's my argument in both of these books, in Three Cornered and in Saving Yellowstone, that we should be talking about the Indian Wars not as a completely separate conflict, but as part of the Civil War and Reconstruction, right? Um, instead of just kind of siloing it as a separate, entirely separate event. So, what do we learn when we see the Civil War and Reconstruction not from the North or the South, but from the Far West? In terms of the Civil War, seeing the Civil War from this region kind of shows us um, that the war was in fact three-cornered. It was about the North and the South, but it was also about the West. It reveals that Lincoln and other Republicans kind of fell in line with commonly held beliefs about Native peoples and their place in American society. Um, I think Lincoln was both ahead of his time and deeply embedded in it, um, especially in this instance. Um, and it's important to acknowledge that these beliefs united Democrats and Republicans, right, all white Americans, really, in the 1860s and 70s. And it's equally important to acknowledge that Lincoln and the Republicans fought simultaneously for the emancipation of enslaved people in the East and the extermination and or removal of Native peoples in the West. And, you know, we think of these as contradictory. But for Republicans, this was not at all contradictory because both of these kind of pushed toward that vision that they had of their future um, as a totally free country. Now, seeing Reconstruction from the Far West allows us to see how the federal government followed through on plans for conquest of this region in the 1850s and then during the Civil War. You know, there's a through line here that we don't often talk about. It also shows us that the effort to conquer the West was about politics and economics, and it was also about native land dispossession. But that indigenous people fought this effort every step of the line. And in the specific case of Yellowstone, we can see that this unique place was not only the world's first national park, but also a perfect metaphor for the country 
at mid-century. It was a place both awe-inspiring and dangerous, both fragile and powerful, and a place where what lies just beneath the surface is always threatening to explode. Thank you. I didn't, yeah, I didn't leave much time for questions, but I think we have... Uh, they can ask some questions. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I'll be going to the book signing after this. So if you have other questions, ask those too. But... Hi. Um, I am an eighth grade teacher. Yes. And so I do teach Civil War. Um, mm -hmm. But our textbooks and none of the resources we have yes. mention anything about the West really in relation to the Civil War. It's mm -hmm. very much just North and South. Are there any like resources that you can mm -hmm. think of that might be good for teachers that are trying to kind of bring the West into this in the classroom? You know, I really wish that there was some really contained archive that I could direct you to. I mean, the military records for the campaigns in the Civil War are all in the OR. Like, they're all right there um, to be scanned and, and posted and analyzed. Um, but as of now, I mean, this, military historians have been talking a bit about the West, um, this, the far West, not the Trans-Mississippi, the far West, um, for a while now. But it hasn't, you know, obviously has not <laughs> caught up <laughs> with, with anyone. So there hasn't been a digitizing sort of site, unfortunately. I would love to do that. But um, definitely ask me afterwards, because I can give you some citations for things um, where you can look at either particular orders or battle reports or you know, reports of the full Sibley campaign, um, along with some photographs and illustrations and things that will be like, oh, actually, this, this action is happening in the far west, um, in addition to the east. Yes. Oh. So I have a question um, about Philetus Norris. About, I'm sorry? Philetus Norris. Oh, Philetus Norris. Yeah, sorry. Yeah. 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 Um, how did he end up being the first, like not professional, but paid superintendent of the park? Like, how did he get picked to do that job? That is a very good question. I am trying to remember, right? Because Norris kind of comes in in the epilogue in the book. Um, he's actually the second um, superintendent um, because the first superintendent is Nathaniel Langford, who was one of the first civilians entering Yellowstone, and his it was his expedition that kind of prompted Hayden to do it. And in that time that Langford was the superintendent, Congress didn't give him any money. Right. He didn't do anything. Like, and, and this is what's interesting about the Yellowstone Act. It took 18 years for Congress to create another national park, right? It wasn't until 1890. So it's not like this started, like, the ball rolling for this whole national parks era. Um, <clears throat> and I think Philetus Norris was fairly well known. I mean, there's the famous photograph of him in all of his like deer skins. It's very like Teddy Roosevelt, right? Um, and he's the one who actually went into the park. He managed to get $10,000 from Congress to actually create some roads and build some structures. Um, so he made some headway. Ultimately, the US Army had to come in um, and run the park, because this is all before the, the creation of the National Park Service. So um, I am not exactly sure how he came to the attention, though, of Congress. I'm sure it was through some relationship uh, that he had with a local representative who suggested him for the job. And then, and then you know, because who was his competition, really? <laughs> yeah. yeah, one more question. Yeah. This is uh, slightly tangential. <laughs> Delight. I read The Three Cornered War. Um, I was always curious, traditionally I have learned that when white Americans moved into Texas and you know, the Mexican government gave them permission to be there, mm -hmm. they wanted them to you know, convert to Catholicism, outlaw slavery, et cetera. I learned in reading The Three Cornered War that although African slavery had mm -hmm. been abolished by the Mexican government, they still enslaved Native Americans on a fairly yes. large scale. And I'm kind of curious, like, what was the distinction there? Why mm -hmm. was one acceptable and one not? Right. That was a specific Texas issue um, because uh, Mexico initially had viewed Texas as a buffer, right? They, they allowed Anglo migration. 
Um, in that early period, when Anglo planters came with their enslaved people, they allowed that because they wanted them as a buffer against particularly the Comanche and, um, and also the Apache. So <clears throat> when they, they never imagined that actually Anglos would come in such huge numbers. So they, the act that they passed in, in 21, um, and this was after actually, um, well, and they were in the 1830s, which was, was really making Texans angry. But the, um, the act that they passed then was about containing that Anglo migration. And it wasn't as much about black slavery versus indigenous slavery. Um, in New Mexico, there were very few black slaves. Um, enslavement was almost entirely indigenous. Um, and then also it was part of a very long history of raiding back and forth between Hispano communities, Spanish and then Mexican, and then um, and Navajo and Apache and Comanche peoples. And there was like a huge trade in people. Uh, so there were Hispano slaves in indigenous communities and there were indigenous slaves in Hispano communities. And that was seen as just a different Thing entirely, um, but they did allow enslavement legally in New Mexico um, and actually passed a law explicitly saying that it was legal in 1859, um, that black slavery was legal. Um, so, and then very quickly withdrew that <laughs> after, after the US Army established control. Um, so those were, it's, it's fascinating. I mean, this area of the country and borderlands history is very interesting because Texas and New Mexico and California are three very different um, parts of what was northern New Spain and then northern Mexico. All right, thank you guys very much. Enjoy lunch. For a more in-depth discussion with this speaker, go to patreon.com slash addressing Gettysburg.